Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need your help now to make plain the greatest, the greatest news in the world. This, this text in Jeremiah 32 is inexpressibly glorious, and that's the way you are. And I ask for help now to both speak it with uh, truthfulness and an appropriate affection, and that you would give good ears to hear and hearts to receive. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in yesterday's New York Times, there was an article about the Webb Space Telescope and a particular picture that it was taken. Some of you saw it, perhaps. Uh, this, uh, the Webb Telescope launched two and a half years ago on Christmas Day, and it's now a million miles away from the Earth. It's in orbit around the sun. It'll finish its orbit in a couple of decades. And this picture had in it a, a vast stretch of galaxies. And down in the middle right-hand part was a perfectly formed question mark made up of hundreds of thousands of miles of dust clouds, they said. And now this, this article, I'm reading it in the car driving down yesterday on my phone. And I was so thankful for this article because it just launched me into real affection for the fact that I get to talk to you about the creator of the universe and his purpose for Faith Baptist Fellowship and, and Dana Olson's life and, and Krista's and, and Anna's and Mary's and Betsy's life for the next season I get to talk about this. Now, what, what really fired me up was not, not that we're going to talk about astronomy and not, not that I learned anything new about the universe. In fact, it was, as I came to the end of the article, I was so profoundly disappointed and sad and given a sense of urgency about what we're doing in this room right now. So I'm going to read you the last paragraph, and you'll see why. It had that effect, I think. It was written by Dennis, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, over by, over B. Quote, we've barely begun to know anything. That's why we build telescopes. Once the web has completed its rounds of investigations in two decades from now, we might know a bit more about this bowl of stars but we still won't know why we are here. That question mark, our profound cosmic ignorance, is one of the great gifts of science. End of article. So the great gift of science according to Overby, is to underline for us the profound ignorance that we don't know why we exist. The gift of science. If that's, if that's the gift of science, and I don't believe that's the gift of science. I'm pro-science. That's not the gift of science. And that's another sermon, but... Just know how I feel about that. If that were the gift of science, it would not be a gift, it would be a curse. To wake up every morning and have to say, I have no idea why I exist. That's not a gift. That's a curse. And it's a curse under which millions of people are being taught to live. We don't believe that. I didn't come here to share that ignorance. We have been born again through the living and abiding word of God. God has spoken. 
His word has made us new, and he has told us why we exist. I'll put it in a sentence. We'll start moving through a few experiences, come to Jeremiah 32, and we will exult together in the greatest reason for being. So you exist to know, to enjoy, and to reflect the glory of God, the creator of the universe, the redeemer of your souls, especially the glory of his sovereign, sustaining grace. That's why you exist. So what is God's sovereign, sustaining grace? And where in the Bible is it made plain that this is our portion? So let me give you a four-line rhyming definition of sovereign, sustaining grace. And then I'm going to tell you a couple of stories to illustrate my meaning, and then we'll go to Jeremiah 32. So if you want to open your Bibles to Jeremiah 32 and just stick your finger in or your ribbon or, or uh, hold your phone that way, then we'll be ready to go when we get there. Jeremiah 32. So what is sovereign, sustaining grace? Not, start with a negative, not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain. And then in the darkness is there to sustain. Now, the reason I celebrate a grace that does not bar what is not bliss and the reason I celebrate grace that is not a flight from all distress is because if I celebrated a grace that did bar you from, keep you from what is not bliss, namely, are you guys say that right? What is hard? It wouldn't be biblical. It just wouldn't be true. It wouldn't be true to experience, and it wouldn't be true to the Bible to say grace gives us flight from all distress. Grace bars us from what is not bliss. That's just not true. It's not true to experience, and it's not true to the Bible, so I'm going to start with experience and then go to the Bible to try to help you feel the wonder of that meaning of sovereign, sustaining Grace. So Bob Ricker was the president of the Baptist General Conference, now Converge Worldwide, years ago, came to our church. He told me this story. He said uh, he, he married his daughter. He did the wedding for his daughter. And in the wedding, he, he pointed out some s small scars on her neck and called them in front of everybody memorials of grace. Memorials of sovereign, sustaining grace. And then he told the story. She was in a car accident. It was a terrible accident. She was turning blue because she couldn't breathe. The car behind pulled over, and there was a doctor in the car. And he had an air tube. And he had the courage and the will to force it into her throat and save her life. <laughs> That's pretty unusual. That's remarkable grace. <laughs> and he called them memorials, memorials of grace. Now, Bob Ricker's not naive. He knows that if God can ordain that a car be following his daughter with a doctor, that the doctor have a device in his pocket, 
and that he have the fearlessness not to be sued to use it on her he could have prevented the accident easy you can't celebrate the grace of all those providences and not realize that not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain. Here's another story. I was confirming this in the car on the way down yesterday because it happened a long time ago, and it happened to Noel. And Barnabas and Abraham and, and Talitha, little baby Talitha, this is 26 years ago. And uh, they were driving without me. I'm at a conference, going to meet them in South Carolina. They're driving through Indiana, just south of Indianapolis, and the, the radiator goes out in the middle of nowhere on a Saturday. A mom, a baby, two teenagers, a teenager, and yeah, two teenagers, I think it was. They're sitting there on the side of the road thinking, oh man, it's Saturday. A farmer drives up and stops, gets out and sees the problem. Noel says, I don't know what to do. I, I, we'll probably need a motel, and maybe we could find help on Monday morning to, to get the car fixed and get, be on our way. And he said, well, why don't you stay with us? Now, you're a mom, and he's a stranger, and... and she says, I don't want to put you out. And, and he says, well, you know, the Lord says that you're serving him when you help others. Hmm. Is that enough? <laughs> and, and, and he calls his wife. Now, I said to her in the car, this was pre-cell phone. How would he do that? And, and she said, I don't know how he did. He had, he had some kind of device in his car. <laughs> and his wife gives him the thumbs up. He says, why don't you go to church with us tomorrow if you can take a Baptist church? <laughs> okay. Good. okay. So they go and they stay with the farmer's family. He's an aviation mechanic, retired. He gets up on Monday morning. He drives into Indianapolis. He purchases a radiator. He comes back. He puts it in, no charge, and they're on their way by mid-morning on Monday. Meanwhile, Barnabas got his fishing rod out of the car, threw it in a pond on their property, and caught a 19-inch catfish to make the vacation. Okay, so if God can ordain that there be a farmer, that he have the grace to stop, that he be an aviation mechanic, that he have a wife who's full of hospitality, that he has money enough to purchase, that he's a kind man, that he puts it in, and that they're on their way, and they're not charged anything, and in the meantime, Barnabas catches a 19-inch catfish. He could have Save the radiator. This is a no-brainer, folks. You hardly need the Bible to know that's the way life works. Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain So I was uh, talking to a young man in our church who said he was dealing with a real serious physical thing and, and he, he had prayed and prayed and it, it wasn't being healed. And he said, you know, Pastor John, it would, have, it would have been easier if Jesus hadn't healed but had just said, I'll give you the grace to sustain you in the midst of the sickness. And my answer to him, my response to him was, well, that is, in fact, what he did sometimes. 
like in 2 Corinthians 12, when he gave, he, he gave the thorn to Paul, the thorn in the flesh, which was painful. That's what thorns are. They hurt. In order to keep Paul humble, and Paul prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and, and you remember the response of Jesus to the prayer? My grace, sovereign, sustaining grace, my grace is sufficient for you for, for the non-healing of the thorn. My grace is sufficient for the non-healing of the thorn. My power is perfected in weakness, to which Paul responds as a model for all of us. Most gladly, you can hardly believe that, right? It hurts. Most gladly, therefore, will I boast about my weaknesses. And that was the thorn. That the power of Christ may dwell in me. That was the power not to heal, right? but to sustain. The power of Christ may rest upon me, so I am content with weaknesses and insults and distresses and persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake, because when I am weak, then am I strong. Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our thorns. And then in the darkness is there to sustain so now, please open your Bibles to Jeremiah 32. I love this text. It is one of my favorite texts because it is breathlessly glorious. I know every time I take up a text like this, I'm inadequate because I can't feel what I ought to feel. I'll be glad. One, one, of, the, one of the reasons I'm, I'm glad for heaven is because we, we won't just be sinless, which is a glorious thought, saved to sin no more, but we will be able to feel like we ought to feel. The situation is, is bad for, for Israel, as this is being written. And what we're getting at here, just don't miss this, that we're getting at the sovereign sustaining grace that has kept this church for 44 years. Why do you still exist after 44 years? This is why. Why has Dana been faithful for 40 years and 14 years? And why can you be hopeful for the next century or shorter, come Lord Jesus? And why can Dana be hopeful? For this season of ministry. Why? So it's bad right now. Verse 36. Are you with me? 32, 36. Now therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning this city, Jerusalem, of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Now that's that's what they say, and that's true. It's true. Grace has not spared them this calamity. In fact, grace has ordered it. God was angry at Israel. After centuries of rebellion, they have now been sent into bondage and exile. That's what they say. They don't have the last word. God does, and here's what he says in verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands to which I have driven them. In my anger, in my wrath, and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. So God declares very clearly, I ordered this pain. I have driven them, he says. I drove them to these foreign lands. And he declares that he himself will bring them back 
to their land. In other words, sovereign grace will eventually triumph, but its working does not guard from what is not bliss. Now my question for us is, how can we be sure that sovereign grace, sustaining grace, will keep us and keep this church faithful to the end? How can we know? That's the urgent question that this text is going to answer. And the answer is, sustaining grace for God's chosen people is sovereign grace. That's the answer. The grace that sustains us until Jesus comes or until he calls is sovereign grace. And this text will make very clear what that means in just a moment. It overcomes all obstacles. It preserves faith, preserves holiness, brings you home to heaven with all the conditions met. That's your only confidence. I've asked people all over the country, maybe even the world, what makes you think you're going to be a Christian tomorrow morning? What makes you think you're going to wake up and believe Jesus instead of, I'm done. I mean, you've watched people be done. It's called deconversion. It's a big deal today. We know people. We love people like that. Why won't it happen to you? What's your answer to that? What is your confidence that tomorrow morning you will be a Christian? You will wake up and your heart will still incline to the Word, still incline to Christ and faith. If I were left to myself, I would have made shipwreck of the faith a long time ago. <laughs> if you think that you will be a Christian tomorrow morning because you're confident you will exercise your free will that way, that's not a biblical way of thinking. That's not your confidence. I wonder if you if you you do sing at this church gloriously and I ha, I will bet you have sung oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a what's another word for fetter chain right <laughs> Let thy goodness, like a chain, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O oh God, and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You, you pray that way. You sing that way. I mean, is that a biblical way to think? Really? Chain me? I like to be free. I can get there. I can maintain faith. I can be faithful. I can be holy. I don't need any chains. That's not the Bible. That's just a hymn. Is it biblical? Why are you going to be a Christian for the rest of your life? Why will this church be here? Why will Dana, after 10 or 15 or 20 years of faithful prayer ministry, <laughs> love Jesus and want to have a little talk with Jesus? Why will his heart be there? And the answer is because sustaining grace is sovereign grace. Now, little, I wish I had time to preach a whole sermon on the new covenant. But you do know that even though the phrase new covenant is not used in chapter 32, it is in chapter 31, and chapter 32 is a continuation. And the new covenant which Jesus, he said, he held up the cup, remember at the Last Supper, the cup representing his blood, said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What did that mean? That meant when I shed, when I shed my blood, I purchased for you all the privileges of the new covenant. That's what it means. I bought this for you. I sealed it with my blood, the new covenant. 
Now, what's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant? The old, this is the covenant that I made with Moses and Israel when I brought them. The covenant which they broke, says the Lord. That will never happen with the new covenant. Ever. It will not be broken by you or him. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean it won't be broken by us? How, how, how could that possibly be ever said by a fickle person like, for a fickle person like me? Now we're ready to read the rest of the text. This is a new covenant promise. And just another little word. Uh, I hope you Christians who mostly are Gentiles, there may be some Jewish friends here, Christian Jews, not yet Christian Jews, but most of you are, are not Jews, and this is a promise made to Israel. So you're asking, well, how can you preach on this? You're a Christian, you're a Gentile, this is a Christian church, why are you taking this promise and applying it to us? And the answer is a big sermon from Galatians. In Jesus Christ, all the promises of God are yes. Yes. In the seed, you are the heirs of Abraham. You are true Israel. You are spiritual Jews. It's a whole sermon. And if you haven't preached on it recently, there you go, Mike. <laughs> Just help these people know how all the Jewish promises are theirs in Christ Jesus. So that close that sermon, and I'm just going to assume you believe that. And it's okay to be in Jeremiah 32 and exult as Gentile believers in Jesus the Messiah that it's ours. This is ours. Okay. Here we are in verse 38. They shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for their good and for the good of their children after them, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. I love that sentence. <laughs> and I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. It doesn't get any better than that. So four promises. Let me just draw your attention to them briefly. Number one. I will be your God. Verse 38. They will be my people and I will be their God. All the promises of God are summed up in that sentence. Faith, Baptist fellowship, I will be your God. Dana, Krista, I will be your God. That is, all my godness holding in being the question marks in the galaxy, holding in being well, everything that the, that the web telescope is seeing, all that I am as God and all my power and all my wisdom and all my love, I will exert for your good. That's what it means to be your God. It's breathtaking. You should spend the rest of your life meditating on, rejoicing in. He's my God. My creator and my redeemer in Jesus Christ is my God. That's promise number one. Number two, God will change our hearts. We don't change our hearts. God changes our hearts. God promises to do it. Verse 39, and then in the middle of verse 40, Here's verse 39. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always. So if you fear God, that happened to you. I tell pastors who come into churches who haven't been well taught like you have been, I say, look, your, your, your job for most of the time you're here is to help people understand what happened to them when they got saved. Because they don't know. 
They don't know what happened to them. It happened. It really happened. They're really saved. They are. But they've been so badly taught, they have no idea what you did, what God did. He did this. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me. The only reason to sing Amazing Grace is that. So many have been, people have been taught that they did it. They did it. They didn't do it. God did it. That's why you sing to grace, sovereign grace. So God will not simply, here's the, here's the middle of verse 40. I didn't finish reading, so you got with me in the middle of verse 40, near the end. I will put the fear of me in their hearts. Sovereign, sustaining grace. If you're a Christian, God put the fear of himself in your heart. May have done it when you were six. I think I was saved when I was six. I don't even remember it. I don't remember being an unbeliever. I just know all the evidences that I don't hate God, I don't reject Jesus, I love holiness, I love the word. All those are impossible for a dead sinner. So I must be alive. <laughs> if you ask somebody, are you alive? They shouldn't re reach for their birth certificate and show you. They should say, <gasps> <gasps> living in Christ is the evidence you've been born of God. He put the fear of him in your life. Raise you from the dead. Amazing. So he promises to change your heart, put the fear of God in you. Number three, third promise. He will not let you turn away. Verse 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. That's the essence of the new covenant. I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. If you turn away from him and are rebellious till you die, you were never a member of the covenant. 1 John 2.19 says that so clearly. They went out from us because they were not of us. Because they had, if they had been of us, they would not have gone out. But they went out that it might be clearly seen that they were not of us. Pray against that. Bind my heart. And bring them back while they breathe. So his heart work is so powerful that he guarantees we won't turn from him. I'm 77. I've been a believer for 71 years. Because of that promise alone. He kept me. He will hold me fast. <laughs> Finally, promise number four. If you think it can't get better, it can. And now it's going to get better as we close. 41, verse 41. And I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. So at the front end of that verse and at the back end of that verse, God describes the intensity of his commitment to you. The intensity of it. 
You know, it's one thing to have somebody committed to you. I come for you. And another thing for them to say, with all my heart, with all my soul, nothing made me happier than to be committed to you. That's what that verse says. I will rejoice in doing you good. Part of my heart, no. Not part of my heart. Part of my soul, no. Not part of my soul. All my heart, all my soul is into your good. That's God talking. <laughs> you see why I prayed at the beginning? You're like, I can just tell. You don't feel this the way you should. I can tell. You're looking at me like, well, I, I suppose that's good. You Neither do I. How great is that? How great is the intensity of God's desire for you? Let's try this. Um, let's take all the desires in the world, all of them, like desire for food, desire for sex, desire for money, desire for fame, desire for power, desire for meaning, desire for friends and family, desire for security, add yours. Okay, we got all those desires. And let's just multiply them by all the people in the world, like 8 billion. Okay, now you got all the desires that you've ever felt and will feel and their intensity. And you got 8 billion people feeling those desires and you multiply that and you put it in a container. How would that container compare to the statement, God's desire with all his heart and with all his soul? God's rejoicing over you to do you good with all his heart and with all his soul. How would that container and that intensity compare? They would compare like a thimble to the ocean, to pick up on Dana's beloved ocean of grace. I'll challenge you. There's no, there's no pastoral flourish. There's no sermonic um, exaggeration here. You cannot even conceive of an intensity of desire greater than that expressed in God's with all my heart and with all my soul. You can't even conceive of anything greater. If you think you can, stand up right now and tell me. And if you're right, I'll sit down. Or come to me afterwards if you don't want to make a fool of yourself. Or make a fool of me in your kindness. Just tell me afterwards. What is conceivably greater than an infinite God engaging all of his heart and all of his soul to do you good. What is more intense? Nothing. This is why we have to pray for the ability to feel what we ought to feel. You should be the most happy, the most courageous, the most confident people in the world. Some of you might be tasting this sustaining sovereign grace for the first time this morning. And if you are tasting it like, wow, if that were true, that would be wonderful. And I would just plead with you, keep welcoming it. Don't push it away. The devil wants you to push away sustaining sovereign grace and say, no, it can't be, it just can't be true. God can't be that way toward his people who trust him. It can't be. You push it away. It's too good. I think a lot of people reject Christ, not because it's boring, because it's just too good. It can't be true. Most of you, I'm assuming, in this room have tasted this and lived with this sweet assurance for decades. I can see a lot of older folks like me this is not news to you. It's just glorious. 
<laughs> That's what we do on Sundays. We exult in familiar, glorious things with each other. It has sovereignly sustained you in the worst of times, the best of times. Pain has not pushed you into bitterness. Pleasure has not lured you into idolatry. God has kept you. He has held you fast with all his heart and with all his soul. He has done it for your church, Faith Baptist Fellowship. He has done it for Dana and Krista and Anna and Mary and Betsy. And he will do it. He will do it. He'll do it for you as a church. He'll do it for Dana and his family. This is sovereign sustaining grace. And to know it, to rejoice in it, to reflect it, is the answer to the New York Times question mark. That's why we exist. To know it, enjoy it, reflect it, especially the glory of his sovereign grace. Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain. However long the sorrows last, this mighty grace will hold you fast. Father, as we sing that now, I pray that it would be true in our hearts that if there's any, anyone in this room that has a doubt concerning the preciousness or truthfulness or sufficiency of your grace in this way, that as we sing, that doubt would be taken away and a sweet assurance would flood this room that you have kept this church, you will keep this church, you have kept Dana, you will keep Dana and Krista and Anna and Mary and Betsy for this next chapter until you come or until you call. We thank you and we ask for your help to feel this as we ought. In Jesus' name, amen.